And good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's session of America's Civil War with Arthur Godley. My name is Nicole Signoli, and I am the new director here at Edith Wheeler. Lauren is out today, so I am your hostess. Um, this recording is going to be um, available on YouTube within the next few days. Well, a little bit longer with the holiday. This series is co-sponsored by the Friends of the Library and the Monroe Historical Society. Today's session is the War on Rivers and Seas. And the next session will be held in two weeks, January 12th. That will be from Atlanta to Appomattox. <clears throat> um, your cameras are set to on. Your mics are set to off and you can change this at any time you need to. We ha I have enabled um, the closed captioning if you wish to use that. You can also turn that off by hitting the green CC button on either the top or the bottom of your screen. Uh, we do encourage questions and comments and stories throughout the session. We ask that you use the chat box or raise your hand feature um, where Arthur will stop periodically and address any questions, I will be monitoring the chat box. And at the end, there also will be time for Q&A. Now to introduce our host, Arthur Gottlieb, local historian on subjects of political and military history. He was also a member of the U.S. Coast Guard for 17 years, stationed in Long Island North. He was a curator of naval history and a technical director of exhibits, the Intrepid, and now continues his work with veterans as a certified senior advisor and counselor, where he works with those returning from Iraq and Afghanistan pro bono. Welcome, Arthur. Thank you so much. And uh, welcome to the library and, and as your congratulations on your position as director. Okay. Um, hi, everyone. I uh, hope everyone's having a good holiday season. Uh, and I hope that uh, COVID isn't driving you insane, okay? As it is for me and so many of my coworkers. Um, so I have a great presentation for you today. It's on the naval aspect of the Civil War. And uh, as we were chatting about before we were on recording, I mean, this is something, I mean, it, it, it could be a six part series just on the naval aspect of it. In our uh, context, I just wanna show you how important this is. And I'm gonna highlight one of the more famous battles of, of the naval clash between the Confederate States of America uh, ships and the American uh, ships. Well, actually the both American ships, right? The, this, the North Navy, uh, and that was, of course, the Monitor versus the Merrimack, all right? So um, I want, and this will give us a flavor of what was going on here in the Civil War and put it in context time-wise. <clears throat> all right, so I'm gonna go to screen share and bring up my slide presentation for you. Slideshow. I've made my I've made my cursor my arrow this big red thing today so you can see it because we've got a couple of maps and I want to point out a couple of things. Can everybody see our first slide okay? Yeah, good. So this is um, to put in context and the, one of the things that made the civil war the civil war in in the fashion that we're talking about it in context was the fact that this was a tremendous period of development. Uh, regarding um, the technology, the technology of the second industrial revolution specifically. Uh, in the middle part to the latter part of the 19th century, the industrial revolution uh, really was, um, belonged to the United States of America and also Germany, uh, two major up and coming um, industrial powers. And what represented the industrial power of the 19th century was steam. And um, 
imagine for a minute, like today, if we were talking about one of our wars today, uh, it would obviously be heavily influenced by computer technology, GPS, drones, and all the rest of that. Um, that was the same kind of revolution that we had back in those days, except it, except we have uh, steam power and machinery, mostly. We were talking about the importance of getting troops on station uh, via trains, right? Which is obviously a, an invention of uh, a product of the steam era and also technology in the form of the telegraph, which for the first time in history gave um, the president of the United States or a national leader instantaneous communications, practically instantaneous communications with the battlefront. All right, one of you has your microphone on and it sounds like you're uh, building something. All right, so if I could ask you to either stop building something or to, to silence your mic, thank you. All right, so this is my opening slide for you, USS Monitor engaging the CSS, right? So USS stands for United States ship, CSS for, stands for Confederate state ship. Uh, and the, the Merrimack, as it's generally known, its actual name is the Confederate state ship, Virginia, you see. And the battle took place on 9th of March, 1862. And I'm gonna give you the history of this here. Um, it's a famous thing and, and it's so, so pivotal, not just in American Civil War history, but also in world history. Because what happened here and the technological advancements that occurred uh, between the North and South in the Civil War affected warfare and affected politics globally. Right, so this is the way naval ships looked. I mean, it was basically unchanged uh, from the time of, you know, Napoleon or uh, Nelson off Trafalgar and, and, you know, this sort of a thing. And this happens to be a photograph of the United States Navy at Portsmouth, uh, New Hampshire. And uh, if you think of a ship, if you've ever visited or uh, seen pictures of or been fortunate enough to be on the USS Constitution, uh, that's what our whole Navy looked like, right? And these are even larger ships than the Constitution. These are complete, you know, men of war, like, you know, these big three-decker, two-decker major warships. So the idea, of course, was to have a platform where you could have all of these cannons, and then, you know, your enemy would have a similar vessel, and then you'd come and the guns couldn't move, so you had to move the ship. And then wherever you move the ship that the broadside was facing, the side of the ship, was where the cannons were pointed. And that's literally how you aimed the guns as far as, um, as, far as the direction was concerned anyway. And keep in mind that this was all done by sailing skill. So if you've ever been a fan of um, yacht racing, Right, and you know that if one boat gets in front of the other boat, they have the wind advantage and all this kind of a thing, right? It was the same thing in warfare. It wasn't just a matter of, of being able to shoot straight, which was essential. You had to know how to sail better than your enemy, you see? So it added a whole nother, a whole nother strata of skill, right? And that's the way it had been. For, for so many times, uh, for over the holidays, if you've ever seen movies like I always watch um, uh, Ben-Hur, right? And if you, you, I'm sure you must be familiar with the movie and you know, you've got the, the, uh, the emperor's ships, right? That are being propelled by, you know, the slaves, right? And of course, Ben-Hur was, what was it? Number 41, if I'm not mistaken. And, um, so this kind of naval warfare was, was always very important. Uh, those, those boats in Ben-Hur were being, were being powered by oars. And, but one of the most important things about those ships that Ben-Hur was on as a slave at that point 
was that the method of attacking another ship was with this big pointy prow called a ram. And so you remember ramming speed? I'm sure you must remember that. And there was a guy there with the drum and then everybody would be rowing, right? Ramming speed meant that you pointed your ship to the other ship and you rammed it. And then underwater, you would seek to make this massive hole in the other ship. And that's how you sank the ship. It wasn't by guns, it was by ramming. And that's important today because the major weapon that the Confederate state Virginia had, although it had a full complement of cannons, its primary weapon was an underwater ram. You see, so I'm trying to bring the ancient into the middle of the 19th century and show you how it actually bridges into the future. And um, and a tremendous amount of tradition. You know, I was around the naval services between the Navy and the Marine Corps and the Coast Guard for uh, collectively about 27 years. You know, and there's a tremendous amount of tradition and culture and all the rest of this in the Navy. And back in those days, you know, in the American Navy and all navies around the world, you started off if you wanted to. I mean, you, know, you were a 13 year old. You were, I mean, how old is this kid, right? And you would be something called a powder boy. And the uh, your idea was that uh, in battle, you'd be running down to the magazine where the explosive was kept, which is basically black powder, and you'd be bringing the powder back to the guns. And it was also your job to sprinkle around a lot of sand on the deck, because in about five minutes, the deck is going to be so slippery with blood that the sand was the only thing you had from traction. Okay. I had this crazy discussion one day. Um, what was the name of that um, that political candidate who was a who was a, an entrepreneur, something Ross? What was his name about thirty years ago? You know who I'm talking about. And um, he was he came to buy these paintings that we had. Can't believe I just forgot his name. He came to buy these paintings we had at the Intrepid, and they were of sailing ships in at war. And he was talking to me about that the really the most people who got killed on the in these sailing um, engagements with guns was not by getting hit by a cannonball. It was the fact that when you hit the wooden walled sides of the ship with the cannonball, it would cause the hardwood to the hardwood to explode in essentially a thousand pieces of razor sharp daggers. And that's what, you know, I mean, you got one of those that lands in your eye, it lands in your spine, it, it takes out your liver. That's what killed everybody. I mean, if the chances are of you getting directly hit by a cannonball was relatively slim. People were dying from all of the wood splinters that were flying around. Ross Perot. That's who it was. You know, that would have drove me crazy. Right, Ross Perot. That's who I was having this conversation with. Guy walked in with a room full of bodyguards, right? Ross Perot. He bought the pictures, by the way. Me and this other guy had to drive all the way down to Washington, DC. I had to buy a suit. Now, here's another thing that changed everything, right? This is a uh, painting obviously, of the North River, North River as in Hudson River, by the way, steamboat Claremont, 1807, 1807. So what you're looking at now is even though you have this vestigial, you know, masts, right, and a sail there, right, this is kind of like a belt and suspenders approach. If the suspenders don't work, the belt is still there. If the belt doesn't work, the suspenders are still there, right? So, you know, I mean, people have been getting boats around by the power of sail for literally a thousand years, and all of a sudden you're going you're gonna to push off the dock without sails? You must be crazy. Let's make sure that this steamboat thing actually works, you know? And so there it is. This is essentially the first steamboat that was carrying passengers 
It's the Claremont. And what they did here was they had this contraption that with this big reciprocal thing. And it turned this thing called a paddle wheel on the side, right? On both sides. Now in technology, I mean, that was terrific. That's like putting an oar in the water. But if you think about it from an engineering standpoint, it's inefficient because the oar is only in the water a portion of the time that work is being done. You see, it would be better if somebody invented something where for each 360 degree rotation, that propulsion was being achieved. You see, a paddle boat doesn't do that. Like who thinks of these things, right? I do. Of course, that's why I don't sleep. Now, here's another idea now. You've got another hybrid. This happens to be a British warship. And this British warship, right? You can see that now it's the shape of an old fashioned sailing ship because that's the way they made ships. But it's a hybrid because it has these two smokestacks like the Claremont, except two smokestacks because it's got steam engines. And not only that, in the case of the warrior, what the British did in this case is they actually, instead of it having wooden sides, in addition to the wooden sides, they bolted wrought iron on the outside of the wood. You see? And that was the next evolution in an armored warship. Now, where are the paddle wheels? Well, the warrior incorporated a new design where that more efficient method of propulsion was achieved because the propulsive device, which we call a propeller, is completely submerged. So that means for each 360 degree rotation of the propeller, propulsion is being achieved and not just when one of the paddles hits the water. You see, so it's more efficient. And see, like I said to you before, belt and suspenders, no, but why don't we leave the mast and the sails there anyway, just in case, you know? And uh, so it's a hybrid, as you can see, nobody ever, they didn't sail these ships um, in, the sand, in the standpoint of hoisting sails anymore. It was a vestige. There is the propeller. Right there is the propeller, and it's functionally the same form that it is today. Of course, today you know propellers are computer aided, uh, as far as their design is concerned, etc. And um, so the you have better propulsion, and you also have better control of the ship because the propeller is right in front of the rudder. You see, and to have steering control, you need to have a flow of water over the rudder. And that is even without the wind, obviously, you will always have a steady stream of water over the rudder because you're creating the stream with your propeller. <clears throat> I could do a six part series on propellers, right? Uh, luckily for you, I won't. And this is a ferry. Right, not, not that uncommon from a lot of the old ferries um, that used to be used. I mean, even in, in my part of the woods, uh, I, mean, I mean that rhetorically, it wasn't woods. Uh, when I was a kid, the Staten Island ferry, car ferries, you know, they used to go back and forth between Staten Island and Manhattan, and they still do, but they don't look like this anymore. You see, so every kind of boat was being used in the Civil War to turn over into some kind of a gunboat, you see? And so you see a, a, an old passenger ferry and it's been literally been retrofitted with these cannons, right? And another good thing about a ferry and things that you have to remember is that when you're on these inland rivers, Right. We had the Mississippi River. We have all of these other rivers. Our story today includes rivers. Um, you need a boat that doesn't take up that much underwater room, right? So in other words, the heavier a boat is, the heavier a ship is, the more room it needs to float, 
right? So like a ship like I used to, you know, that I spent nine years on the Intrepid, right? If you started off at the waterline and you were actually to dive down until you reached the actual bottom of the ship, it would be under full load, it would be approximately 30 feet. You see, so a ship like the Intrepid, a big ship, literally needs 30 feet or else you're gonna ground the ship against a shoal or an underwater obstacle or God knows what, all right? And uh, so you needed boats that had a, what's referred to as a shallow draft, right? That 30 feet I was telling you about, that's called the draft. What's the draft of your boat? How much does your boat draw, you see? Which is the adjective, right? When I worked in, uh, Norwalk Cove Marina, I had to work with the dock master and all the rest of that. And, you know, and we had a lot of what we call transients, people coming in from all over the country, and they needed to rent a, um, a slip, right, because they're on the way to someplace. And that was all a big part of the business. And the first question was, well, how much does your boat draw? So we know where to put your boat, you see. And if you've got a boat that draws more than 10 feet, you must have a pretty big boat. Right, so that means you get the expensive slip, and if you could afford that boat, you could afford what we're about to charge you for the slip. Okay, and so these shallow draft boats were required. Incidentally, I don't know if you can see this, but on the left side over here, and out of the shop, but on the right side is the paddle wheel. See. Now the strategy of the North was to contain the southern states being able to import anything from the Caribbean or from Europe specifically, South America, and to prohibit the South from exporting anything to those same places, right? So we wanted to starve the South's ability to import, I don't know, guns, ammunition, raw materials, uh, and they wanted to keep the South from being able to export um, all of their um, profit crops, uh, tobacco, cotton, you know, whatever else it might be, you see. So we, it was an economic embargo. You see, now the North, having essentially the bulk of the United States Navy, was able to do that. And this was called Scott's Snake, right, uh, Wilfred Scott. And it's, it was like, it was also called the Anaconda plan, right? So the idea is we're gonna strangle the South's ability to export and import, you see? So, I mean, this is kind of neat. I mean, how can I not put this in this presentation today? I have to. Right, now here, more academically put, okay? So here you see off the coast of um, Virginia, North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia, Florida, Right. And then, of course, the Gulf region. Right. You had the different various squadrons of the northern uh, Navy. Right. The North Atlantic Squadron, the South Atlantic Squadron, East Coast, the East Gulf Squadron, the West Coast uh, Gulf Squadron. Now, there was a tremendous amount of activity of smuggling of southern um, commerce out of the Chesapeake Bay area. OK. Down around Charleston. And here's another critical area down here by New Orleans, because it's the mouth of the Mississippi River. One of the strategic goals of the American, not the American, the, the Union Army was to actually gain control of the Mississippi. And if you gain control of the Mississippi, which was done, by the way, by one uh, William Tecumseh Sherman, and you had Grant also who started off in what's referred to as the West. And you'll split the Western states from the Eastern states. And anytime you create a big split like that, you break their, in military terms, it's called you break their lines of communication. And it's also a moral blow and a, um, a blow of confidence that obviously you're losing the war, you see? Like when I was talking about the Revolutionary War, the goal of the Great Britain was to split off New England 
from the rest of the country, from the essentially the Hudson River on down. And if that could have been done, then it would have fragmented the 13 colonies and the revolution probably would have failed, all right? And um, so I could talk about this over here, Admiral Farragut, damn the torpedoes, you know, full speed ahead, that sort of thing. And uh, it seems a little rash to me, but he's a hero. And then you had another story down over here off Charleston, which I'm going to talk about briefly. And then, but our big story is the one off of Norfolk here. Now you had some pretty successful ships that the, that the South had, famous ships, probably the most famous of all, they were called blockade runners. And there, it was a ship called the CSS, the Confederate State Ship Alabama, which seemed unbeatable. I mean, it was, it was going back and forth to Great Britain, et cetera. And it, nobody could catch it. And when the Alabama uh, ran into people who were trying to catch it, the Alabama always seemed to win. I mean, it's real legacy stuff, you know, to be prideful for if you are, you know, on the side of being the underdog and kicking your enemy's butt, you know. Uh, the Alabama was finally caught up with eventually, but it is a famous story. Right, so here is um, Charleston Harbor, as I was describing to you a moment ago. And the story out of Charleston is another very important thing as far as naval history is concerned. And you have the first actual successful submarine. And what I mean by success, by the way, because I have to qualify that term, was that it was the first submarine in world history to actually sink an opposing vessel. Right, which I guess if you're building a submarine, that's what it's for. And if you have, if you achieve that, then you must have been successful. So the Hunley is essentially something that in, in engineering stuff we call boilerplate technology, right? So in other words, an old fashioned steam boiler. Remember that movie? Um, and it, the African Queen, right? Sure you do, right? Well, Humphrey Bogart and Catherine Hepburn, and, and he's taking a piece of coal and he's throwing him in, you know, in that, the boiler, you know, it's pretty rudimentary stuff. That's a boiler. It, it's just a bunch of riveted together plates to hold enough pressure to keep from exploding, you know? And that's why we call it boilerplate technology. There wasn't any computer aided design to tell you exactly how thick the metal had to be, what kind of metal it had to be, uh, how many rivets it had or whatever, certainly before welding. Right, so what they did was they made, they essentially assembled like several boilers together and they pointed the ends so it would be more hydrodynamic going through the water. They pro put a propeller on this end and inside this tube, they had this long crank and you had, I think it was eight guys that would literally be sitting crouched down, right? And they'd be turning this crank in unison to turn this propeller. And then you have one fellow who was the helmsman, right? Who got to stand all the way up front and, and he was at the helm, which turned the rudder and he got to peek his head out, you see? And it had this long thing in the front of it and it's called a spar. And at the end of the spar, they put an explosive charge. And the idea was to go up to one of the blockading Union warships, which were all made out of wood, right? And fasten that spar torpedo, it was called a torpedo. By the way, a mine is called a torpedo. So it was a spar torpedo, right? Which today we refer to those kind of static mines uh, as mines. Back in those days, they called them torpedoes, right? So when Admiral Farragut down in the Gulf was saying, damn the torpedoes, he wasn't talking about like World War II self-propelled torpedoes that were headed for you. He was talking about static mines. And uh, so the idea is to fasten this mine to the end of a Union warship and then get the hell out of there before the mine went off, you see? And it worked. And they blew this gigantic hole and sank the first ship in history sunk by a submarine. And interestingly enough, just because of our own geographic area, the name of that particular ship happened to be the USS Housatonic, named after our own local river, okay? 
The USS Housatonic was the first ship in history to be sunk in war by a torpedo. And, uh, but the poor Hunley here, right, really the poor people in the Hunley, what happened was that they went out the first time and they had, you know, crazy depth control. I mean, this is a very rudimentary thing. And the, the boat sank. And then the enterprising Confederates went out and they put teams of horses together and they, they put uh, ropes on the Hunley underwater and they dragged it back to shore. They pumped the water out. They took the nine dead guys in there out. Okay. And then they got another nine people to volunteer. And then they put the other nine guys in there. Right. And uh, they went out for the next mission to the blockading fleet at Charleston. And the ship, the same thing happened as the first time. It just sank. And then they did the same thing. They dragged it back to shore. They took the next nine dead guys out. They buried them. OK, and then they flushed the fish out of it and then they got another nine guys. And the third batch of nine guys succeeded in actually attaching the torpedo to the aforementioned Housatonic. And as the and as the Hunley backed away, the submarine backed away. Whatever happened, nobody knows, but it sank. So they succeeded in blowing up the Union ship and sinking it, but the next nine guys went to their depths with the Hunley. And then later on, the Hunley has been recovered, by the way, uh, it's Newport News uh, Museum, uh, Matt Newport, it's a maritime museum, a great uh, museum down there. And as they have, they've actually recovered the whole Hunley and have, you know, they've got all of these conservators, et cetera, working on it and scraping off the mud and finding little buttons and coins uh, and the remains of the last nine fellows who were in there. So that's another thing that actually changed the course of military history was the use of the first successful submarine in the Civil War. Right, so our story that I wanna to talk to you about today is occurs right down here in a place called Hampton Roads, right? And um, you might be familiar with this area. And uh, I almost took a job down at the um, Smithsonian. Uh, they were looking for somebody because I was in charge of the uh, aircraft collection back at the Intrepid back in those days. And they needed somebody to work on their historic aircraft. And uh, for some crazy reason, I wanted to stay up here. Um, I think it was because it's too hot down here for me. You ever been down here in the summertime? It's like the hottest place on earth. I mean, to me. Um, anyway, so Hampton Roads, right down over here, right south of the Delmarva Peninsula. And they got this long bridge tunnel over here, right? Have you ever been over and under that thing? That really long tunnel? It's just incredible. It's very impressive, frankly. I've been I've been under it and I've been over it. I went over it in an aircraft carrier, okay, um, uh, on the USS John F. Kennedy. Um, so anyway, this is where we're talking about today. I want you to take a look at the topography over here because this is really the heart and soul of the Civil War over here, right? So you've got not far from Washington D.C. You've got the capital of the Confederacy, which is Richmond. Right, and then we had this thing uh, called the Peninsula Campaign, right? So the Army of the uh, of Northern Virginia and the Army of the Potomac are are sparring for position, right? And the while the Southern Army is looking to threaten Washington D.C., our army under McClellan is looking to threaten the Confederate capital at Virginia. So you've got to go up the peninsula. It's called the Peninsula Campaign, you see. And the thing is, is that the key to this land warfare is can you secure the river routes that are on either side of the peninsula? And that's where the Navy comes in. See, so now, uh, in a sense, we haven't had a riverine war like this after the Civil War 
until the United States fought in Vietnam, which was equally a river war. You know, we had all of these inland routes of rivers where we had our shallow draft gunboats, et cetera, shallow for the same reason that they needed to be shallow here. And if you've ever seen Apocalypse Now, right, you know that whole story of them going up these crazy rivers, right? Um, so you had to have control of the various rivers and channels around the Chesapeake because you're going to go and deliver armies by sea, not unlike what, I don't know, was done in World War II or even in the Korean War with uh, General MacArthur and his famous surprise landing on Incheon, you see? And, but here, this is all on American soil. Here's a little bit more of a close-up of Hampton Roads, right? This is where that big tunnel, uh, bridge tunnel goes across here. And there's the second one over here called aptly named the Monitor Merrimack Tunnel, by the way, uh, on this other side. And so you've got the James River, right, over here. You've got the Elizabeth River further south, right? You've got the York River, and the whole Chesapeake Bay, and you have to have control of the waterway all around here if you're gonna have control of the peninsula. It's just that simple, you see? So as it turns out, Norfolk now, right, which is where our largest Navy Yard is, is which used to be called Gosport Naval Yard, okay? Um, you've got Newport News over here, and this peninsula is actually held at this point by Union forces. And now this area here, Norfolk, right, and the Elizabeth River and Gosport Navy Yard is held by the Confederates. It makes for very interesting stuff. It's like, you know, on the other side of this, of, of the Hampton Roads is your enemy and vice versa. You see, the James River you may have heard of. I'm wearing today in commemoration of this, um, of my one of my ship shirts, the USS Masapalia. And the, the USS Masapalia was a ship that was in something called the James River Fleet, right? And though that was a, it was a fleet tugboat uh, that is designed to um, to pull damaged warships from the high seas, you see. So, for, you know, for years and years and years after World War II, we kept these ships in, in essentially mothballs. And the, there was a whole fleet in the James River. And the Navy sent me down there. Um, and we, I was on the James River fleet and I was working on a ship called the USS Moss Leo. Uh, and um, it was my job to curate historical items that were on that vessel for posterity. In other words, being an expert in World War II naval construction, it was my job to determine what was salvageable for that ship before the ship went for scrap, you see? And then I would actually be in charge of its removal as well so that said curatorial stuff didn't get like damaged by people with a torch or something like that, right? That's what, literally what I did. I loved it. And um, all the fleet tugboats in the United States Navy were all named after Indian tribes, as is the USS Mossopolia. A close up, another close up here, a little further close, right here. You see? So in between the edge of Newport News and where it says Fort Monroe, that's what we're looking at in our next slide, you see? So I'm going progressively closer. And this is where the whole action was in the bottle for, uh, battle for Hampton Roads or Monitor versus Merrimack or Monitor versus CSS Virginia, all the same thing, right? So you've got Fort Monroe, which is held by the Yankees, if I will. And in between the Newport News Point over here and the entire battle of Hampton Roads occurs essentially in between here and here, right? Uh, rip wraps means a pile of rocks, if you didn't know that. Okay, that's what rip wraps is, all right? Uh, and in between here and here, 
to protect Fort Monroe the, and to protect the entrance to the James River to make sure that the Confederates couldn't make use of it. You see, it's all about who's in control of the waterways because who's in control of the waterways will control where the troops are gonna be, you see? Especially during this peninsula campaign. So you have different ships stationed there, American uh, Union vessels. And the Union vessels off of Newport News at this particular moment in 1861, 1862, are the USS Cumberland, which is right about over here, right? The US, another big ship called the USS Congress. And imagine all of these ships looking like uh, the Constitution, right? The USS Congress. They're sailing ships that have a smokestack, you see? And they have cannons. And then there are several other support ships. You've got another ship called the USS Minnesota, right about here. <clears throat> and then once again, you've got another ship here called the USS Roanoke and another one called the USS St. Lawrence. So the US, the, the Yankee forces have a pretty solid line of armed modern ships, but they're wooden sailing ships with guns, like from the old age of sail, except with steam engines, you see? Sewell's point down here is held by the Confederates. Now down here at Gosport Navy Yard, right, which is now Norfolk Navy Yard, um, you have in the Elizabeth River, you've got this ship that's being built, All right? I'll come back to this slide again. You've got the ship that the Confederates are building, right? This is what it looks like, by the way, off of um, Fortress Monroe, right? From like, you know, not like there's a drone flying over there. This is obviously from somebody's imagination, right? And, you know, so you've got all of these um, uh, Yankee sailing ships all around here, protecting the channels and protecting the, this is the, this would be the Elizabeth River. Uh, so the idea here would be blockading the Elizabeth River because the Confederates hold that. And then from keeping the Confederates to having access to the James River specifically, you see? This is a great picture, it's an actual photograph. Isn't this great? So here's some people standing on the Yankee side, looking out at one of those, uh, those Yankee warships. Isn't that fabulous? Look at the, the hat on that fellow on the right side, isn't that great? And, and it looks just like an old fashioned sailing ship except you see the smokestack because that's a steam vessel and it is a warship and it has cannons all along the side. You see, so besides the fact that it's a steamship for all and other purposes, it's an old fashioned man of war from the days of sail, you know? Now here's one particular vessel that the union had, right? And this photograph is taken right before um, right before the Civil War broke out, right, 1860, even into 1861. And it happens to be a Union warship, a modern Union warship called the Merrimack, you see? And, you know, it's a fine first-class naval vessel. Now, what happened here is that the Merrimack is being serviced at the Gosport Naval Yard, as the Civil War breaks out, right? Now the Gospel Naval Yard is like uh, Fort Sumter itself was a, was a federal facility, you see? And as soon as the Civil War broke out, you know, you've got this major Naval Yard there that's a, uh, that is now in the hands of the Confederates. The Confederates take it over and the Union knows that the Confederates are about to take it over. So the Union forces essentially blow up Gosport Naval Yard, and they leave it in a state of complete rubble, including a ship that was being serviced at the Gosport Naval Yard at the time called the USS Merrimack. So what they do is they, they essentially sabotage the whole place, and they blow the, everything to smithereens so the Confederates don't have access 
to anything that's left over at the Gosport Naval Yard, because then it's going to be used against the Yankees, right? Now, what they did with the Merrimack is they didn't have the, they didn't have a chance. All of the engines were apart and everything. So what they decided to do is just call this a loss. And they just set fire to the Merrimack and made sure that the thing burned and sank, which it did. That's an actual picture of the Gosport Naval Yard after the retreating Union forces essentially dynamited the place into rubble, right? They blew up the ammunition, right? They blew up, the, they, they, they made sure that the cannons were unusable. Uh, they, they destroyed everything that they thought was going to be military use to the Confederates. And if they didn't, the Confederates would just, it would be a, you know, a windfall for the Confederates and they would have all of this stuff. Remember that the Confederate economy did not have the capacity to build mechanical things the way the North did. So anything they could capture at the Gosport Naval Yard, whatever naval stores or weapons or ammunition or anything was going to be something that was be great because they couldn't build it themselves, which is why the retreating Union forces made sure that the place was literally rubble, including one USS Merrimack. Uh, this is a depiction of the Merrimack having been set on fire and it burned essentially to the waterline and then the ship sank. Okay, now remember that these ships are big ships. And remember I was telling you about the draft? Because just because something burns to the waterline doesn't mean that everything that 30 feet underneath the waterline isn't intact. That's the key. So, what the enterprising Confederates did, they're looking around Gosport Naval Shipyard and they're saying, what can we salvage here? And they're looking at the burned out and sunken Merrimack. And they said, why don't we raise this thing? And everything that was completely destroyed above the waterline, we're just gonna remove and we're going to save the guts of the ship, which was preserved because it was underwater. And that's what they did. They raised it. They towed it into what's called a dry dock, which was intact at the Gosport Naval Yard. You close these big caisson doors behind it. You pump the water out, and then you could work on the whole thing. And what they did was they took that sailing ship, and they turned it into the first armored warship. You see, and the first armored warship was the USS, I mean, rather the Confederate state ship, Virginia, and otherwise known as the Merrimack, because that was the ship that they salvaged to make the CSS Virginia, you see? And what they did here was they made it so that when the ship was refloated, you could hardly see anything but this armored citadel. So essentially the ship was impregnable because they had used like three feet of oak and pine. And then they covered that with four inches of like wrought, uh, wrought iron plating. And then on top of the wrought iron plating, they made sure that it was slanted so that whenever any shell that hit the thing would deflect off of it, which is the way that armor still works. You see the, 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 um, the innovation in military technology here? If you look at anything like modern tank, for instance, like an Abrams tank, the Abrams tank, the forward panels are very slanted, right? Because an incoming shell against that slanted surface will, part of the energy will be deflected by the fact that it's in an angle, it's hitting something at an angle. This is the first time in history you saw that. Simple physics. And they took the main deck, which is now underneath that protection of all of that armor. Then they loaded it, they turned it into a warship. They put all of these huge cannons in it essentially. So now this thing is gonna be floating around and unlike a wooden warship that is exposed to gunfire, this thing over here essentially is impregnable from gunfire because all of the enemy shells are going to bounce off of it. 
And it's going to be continuing able to pound the other ships because they're just made out of wood. Now, this was pretty scary stuff. You know, the our spies in the Gosport Naval Yard knew they were building these things. And it created this big panic back north, you see, because essentially when this thing broke out of the Elizabeth River into Hampton Roads, there was going to be nothing that the Union could really do to stop it. This thing could go and it could sink every one of the blockading ships that we have and reduce our Navy, the Northern Navy, to insignificance. Something had to be done. And this thing on the front over here is called a ram. You see, it's a big cast iron ram. So the idea was that the principal weapon of this motorized behemoth was that it was going to point itself towards the nearest Union wooden warship it saw and essentially tear a huge hole in it with the ram. And that's what it looked like when it was afloat. You see, it was just, it had no profile. There was nothing to shoot at, you see, which is another thing that became a very, very important part of naval architecture in the 20th century. Right at the pinnacle of World, of World War II battleship design, you have designs that are formidable, but they made the superstructure as small as possible because it makes it harder for the enemy to be able to hit something that isn't there. You see, that is all of these things. This becomes the modern era immediately. The CSS Virginia is one of the ships, the second one being the monitor, that changed naval warfare forever. And every single Navy in the world became obsolete at this moment. This is the uh, commanding officer of the CSS Virginia, Franklin Buchanan. That is the um, that is the first officer, right? Not what we call today the executive officer, Commander Jones. What happens here is that uh, Captain Buchanan gets injured during the battle, and actually, the first officer has to take over. And there's a depiction of a similar ship. This actually isn't the Virginia. But you see the way it looks when it's on the water. Now, enter the northern part of the story. This is John Erickson, right? Which is a Scandinavian American who is one of these geniuses. He's like a Thomas Edison kind of a guy when it comes to hardware and naval stuff. And, and, and the guy, nobody has a richer mind for developing warships. He designed a ship for the Navy that the Navy looked at uh, before the Civil War. And they looked at it and they laughed him out of the office. Okay, And they said, this thing is ridiculous. Uh, it'll never float. Who would want one of these? You see, uh, things became different after the um, US government was aware of the CSS Virginia being constructed. They had no answer to it. So Mr. Erickson gains favor all of a sudden. And we're like, you remember that crazy thing that you brought here and we basically laughed you out of the office? Yeah, do you still have that? I give you the USS Monitor. Now the USS Monitor is the stuff of science fiction for 1860, the stuff of science fiction, all right? I mean, to look at it, the whole thing's underwater, except this big cylindrical, it looks like a, a giant can of tuna. And the can of tuna holds these two big guns and the can of tuna turns 360 degrees. So for the first time in history, a warship doesn't have to turn the whole ship to bring the guns to bear. It doesn't matter which direction your ship is pointed. You only have to turn the turret. Thank you, John Erickson.
Here's a cross section of the thing. It's a cross section. You can see here's our can of tuna, okay? And there's these two 11 inch Dahlgren rifles, which is the best um, muzzle loading weapon that was available at, of the day. You see, there were large guns in a rotating turret. And the ship itself was just an amazing innovation. It was no pretense here about being half a, a sailing ship or something. This was a, a modern vessel and there was nothing to shoot at. I mean, there was less to shoot at on this ship than there was on the CSS Virginia. Very shallow draft also, perfect for these waters. Unbelievable, the first ironclad, you know, along with the Virginia. Now, Erickson, now that the government is essentially kissing his butt because they're desperate to have something to counter the Virginia, you see, they, he launches this thing in Brooklyn and it was built in like three months, this thing was floating and the steam engines were operating. It was just unbelievable. He didn't even take the time to have all the complete drawings. He was there on site every day and he literally drew hand drawings and gave them to the construction people as they were building it. They launched it off of, um, off of Brooklyn. And it is, so it's a kind of a New York thing. Um, and there it goes into the water and people were like taking bets. This thing is gonna sink right to the bottom. It'll never float, right? But it does float perfectly. This is what it looks like, or at least an artist's description of what it looked like inside the turret. You see, it gives you a good example of of, of the relative size of these massive Dahlgren cannons, you know, and the whole thing is an armored turret, right? And it's completely designed to rotate 360 degrees and the ammunition still be able to come up uh, despite whatever orientation that the turret was to the actual center line of the ship. I mean, it was just brilliant. It immediately made every ship in the world the most modern navies in the world were immediately obsolete. This is John Warden, who was a commanding officer of the Monitor. Now, the problem with the Monitor uh, is that if you're anything more than like a lake, you know, you got problems, you see, because this is not a ship that is designed to take water, you see. It's not designed to be on the heavy seas or to have giant waves splashing off of, over it, you know? Everything is underwater. There's no survivability of this thing, you see? Um, and, and so it was a tremendous danger. It was towed all the way down to Virginia and almost sank several times on the way. <clears throat> so anyway, as far as the battle itself is concerned, the first ship to enter service and cause a lot of damage is the Virginia, right? Nobody knows if the monitor is gonna make it down to this theater of action in time to stop the Virginia. And the Virginia is uh, going to be launched and put into service first because it's a race for time. The Southerners know that the monitor, whatever that is, is being constructed. And they're assuming that it's gonna look like their thing. You see, both sides have spies. You know, it's not like we're walking around with our iPhones taking pictures, you know? So um, they thought that our ironclad was gonna look like their ironclad. And uh, so then when they first time they saw the monitor, they didn't know what the hell they were looking at, you see? So on March 8th, 1862, simple as this, out from Gosport, through the Elizabeth River into Hampton Roads comes the CSS Virginia. And it's pretty much game over, you know, because as everybody knows there's no, there's no way to sink this thing 
you got to hope that because it has so much draft, because remember, it used to be a big sailing ship, you see, it's going to hit one of the shallows in Hampton Roads. And if it grounds, it might not be able to get off and that will save everybody else. But then you're hoping against hope. So the Virginia comes out and remember that ram I was telling you about? It heads for the first American ship right by Newport News Point. And it gets full throttle and runs right into the first ship, the USS Cumberland. And that big cast iron prow blows a big hole from blunt force trauma in the side of the Cumberland. Massive hole enough to sink the Cumberland. And what happens is that the CSS Virginia is now impaling the Cumberland. And the Cumberland, because it's sinking onto the Virginia, the Virginia can't extricate itself from the sinking Cumberland. So the, the Virginia is trying to do whatever it can to wiggle around. And remember, this thing's a, it, it's a monster, you know, it, it doesn't have any real maneuverability and it's got a whole sinking ship on it. And finally, the cast iron prow snaps off and remains impaled in the Cumberland and the Cumberland sinks. And before the Cumberland goes down, by the way, it fires every single gun it can at point blank range at the Virginia which has no effect, of course, but denting the armor in the Virginia. There's nothing you can do to sink the Virginia. You know, so now it's just a matter of emotional retribution that we're gonna keep the last gun firing between as long as they're above water uh, before the whole ship sinks uh, on the Virginia in anger. And that's what they do. So the first ship is gone, as simple as that. USS Cumberland, first line of uh, United States warship, toast, gone. The Virginia, even though it's lost its ram, circles around and then comes back for ship number two, the one that was right astern of the Cumberland, the USS Congress. Now, this is a gun battle, you see, because remember, the Virginia's lost its ability to ram. And like I said before, how can the Congress win a gun battle against a completely armored warship? It can't, right? Though the Congress is an excellent shot, but it doesn't matter because its shells are bouncing off the Virginia and all of the Virginia shells are bursting on and in the Congress. And the Congress is now completely aflame and in sinking condition And what happens here is this is all in sight of Newport News. This is very close to shore, as close to shore as you can get to the Union side, right? So the captain of the Virginia, is they're signaling over to the sinking and burning Congress, strike your colors. In other words, lower your flags, the battle's over, you see? That's it, that's the way it was done. Remember, it's still an age of chivalry. It's still an age of chivalry. And so while this negotiation is going on, there's people, army people, who are on shore on the Union side because the captain is on deck now because he thinks that the battle is paused because the Congress is in the process of essentially surrendering. It can't fight anymore. So the captain of the Virginia comes up on deck. And he promptly gets shot by an American sniper, a Union sniper, right, from shore. I mean, he doesn't know what the hell's going on. He's like, there's the captain, you know, and he shoots the captain. He doesn't kill the captain, but he shoots the captain. <coughs> he got shot in the thigh or something, something like that. Excuse me. Now the captain of the Virginia is, well, in contemporary parlance, pretty pissed off because he thinks that there's a negotiation going on for a truce. And meanwhile, he gets shot. 
Now he orders his commanding officer, right, his executive officer. He says, go back into battle and and I want you to put as much hot iron into the USS Congress as possible and kill all of them. You see what I mean? So now he's angry. He's angry and there's no more truce. There's no more surrender of the Congress. We're going we're gonna to show them Yankees who have no honor, who just disregarded this truce. And then they spend the next hour and a half, two hours, blowing the Congress to bits. Now, this is important. Why is it important? Because the tide is going out. And the tide is going out. The captain and the executive officer of the Virginia know that they better get the hell out of there because they're running out of water. You see what I mean? In other words, it's not deep in this area. And the only reason why the Virginia was able to have a certain amount of maneuverability was because it, was, it came out at high tide. Now the tide is going out and they have to go back to Sewell Point. They've got to go back to the Elizabeth River or they're going to surely ground on something and then they're going to be a sitting duck, right? Not that the Union forces could penetrate the armor anyway, but you see the point, you see? Um, meanwhile, three other Union ships are moving in closer to try to save the Cumberland and the Congress. And those three ships, as I mentioned to you before, were the Minnesota, the Roanoke, and the St. Lawrence. And all three of them run aground on because it's so shallow. So now you got three standard ships out there. So what happens is that the captain of the Virginia calls it a day. The tide is going out. That's in his advantage because those three American ships that just got grounded are still going to be grounded when he comes back out the next morning to finish them off. So the Virginia turns around and heads back down to Gosport. This is a hell of a story, isn't it? I'm excited. I don't know about you. Right. And so now, in the middle of the night, what arrives by, by a miracle, one USS monitor in between the night that the Virginia retreats and goes back to Gosport and is going to come out the next day and blow the hell out of the, red, the rest of the, Ameri the uh, Union squadron. So the next morning, the Virginia comes back out looking for battle. Oh, by the way, here's some uh, artist depictions of the Congress and the Cumberland being blown to bits by the uh, Virginia, okay? Completely one-sided battle. Totally one-sided. The Virginia is gonna come out the next morning and they are going to annihilate the other three ships. You can imagine the kind of morale that they were feeling. They just knocked off two first-class Union warships. They're unstoppable. Yeah, here's the Congress that is surrendering, right? So in the middle of the night, the monitor shows up. The Confederates have no idea. And what happens is that the monitor comes in and it sees the first Union ship, which is the St. Lawrence, which points it downstream to the equally grounded Roanoke, right? And it gets to the Roanoke and the commanding officer of the Roanoke orders the monitor to go stand by the closest ship to the previous day's debacle, the USS Minnesota. So now the monitor is tied up alongside the Minnesota. And dawn breaks, the Virginia comes roaring out of the Elizabeth River, looking to finish the job it didn't finish the day before. And this thing is tied up next to the Minnesota. And they're like, what the hell is that? I don't know, it looks like a barge. Maybe they're just taking supplies on. It looked like a barge. 
And then this little thing casts off from the Minnesota and starts heading for the Virginia. And they're still, they're like, what is that? And then that thing that they don't know what it is turns its turrets around and fires point blank at the Virginia. And now they know what it is. And it's, you know what expletive here, you see? And it's on. And for four hours, the Virginia and the monitor Blow, try to blow each other to pieces to no avail because both ships are essentially invulnerable to the force of the other's cannon fire. You see, now the monitor has the advantage because it's it's a modern ship that's designed for the purpose and it has a, la a lower draft, shallower draft. So it literally has more maneuverability. A couple of times during this, the Virginia grounds and they're able to back off using full speed, you know, this sort of a thing. And, and during the times that the Virginia was grounded, the monitor could literally go 368 degrees around the Virginia and blast it from every single angle. And there's a smell of bacon in the air. And the reason for the smell of bacon in the air is part of the defensive package of the CSS Virginia on top of all of the wood, on top of the armor plate, which is cast iron, wrought iron, they slathered the entire outside of the Virginia with what we call lard to add a slipperiness to the deflection of the American, of the Union shells. And this Virginia was, got so hot from the con con concussions of the monitor shells hitting it that it started to sizzle. Can you imagine this? And imagine also what it must be like inside this ship. It's like taking a garbage can, one of those old metal garbage cans, and I throw it over your head and I beat the garbage can with a baseball bat. That's what that would be like. It would be like having your head inside of a bell when the bell is being rung. You see? So it's inconclusive because both of the ships are essentially unsinkable, right? Here's another shot, a depiction of what it looks like from the Union sides. Here's the monitor and Merrimack. I mean, can you imagine having a front row seat for this? And for four and a half hours, they just pound and pound and pound and pound each other, right? Until the Merrimack, uh, the monitor actually backs off to reload and the Virginia not wanting to get stuck in the shallow, you know, the water being becoming lower and lower and lower, decides to call it a day and goes home. And that's the end of the battle. That's the end of the whole battle. But it changed the entire world. The American ship, the monitor, takes a direct hit. You see this little box on the front? This is the viewing point of the Captain Warden. And it took a direct shell hit right on the eye slot, right on the eyepiece. Right? It's like looking out of a periscope. And it took a direct shot and Warden becomes blinded and his executive officer has to take over. Point blank range. After the battle, here's a shot of the monitor. Beautiful picture. You see the dents? Can you see the dents? It's just incredible. Changes warfare forever. And by the way, you don't want to be inside the ship if you don't have to be in it. It's a sweltering, poorly ventilated place. I mean, so they used to eat their, their meals on decks and everything else. You would hang out, you sleep on deck if you could. This is, you don't want to be inside this thing where the boilers are and everything else. Here's a crew. Nice picture, right? There they are cooking, they're cooking lunch. This is the deck of the monitor. Now, the monitor is trying to go back up the coast now, right, to be of use elsewhere. 
And what happens is even though they've battened the thing down, it gets caught in this gale and the thing takes too much water, turns over and sinks, gone. That's the end of the monitor, just as simple as that. It is not meant for open sea, right? Here's one of its escorting ships that has got it under tow, right? Cause it's being towed up the coast. They can't, they, all they can do is cut the lines and try to rescue people, that's it. Monitor's gone. Now, as the, as the peninsula campaign is progressing, um, what happens is Richmond now is re in real danger of being taken over. As it turns out, it wasn't taken over because McCall McClellan actually dug in and didn't press his advantage, which is one of the reasons why Lincoln decided to fire him for not being aggressive enough. You see, but the knowing that the it was lost, the Peninsula campaign seemed to be lost. Uh, the Confederates essentially abandoned that part of the peninsula where, around Richmond. And what they did here was they didn't want the Virginia to get into the hands of the Yankees. So they set it on fire in the James River until it exploded so that the Yankees couldn't get their hands on it. And that's the end of the Virginia. They also blockaded the James River. So when the, the monitor and another ship tried to go up and take advantage of the fact that the uh, Confederates were fleeing, this is obviously before the monitor sank. Uh, I should have changed the, um, the order of the slides, I'm sorry. Um, the, the Confederates had blockaded the entire river and turned it into kind of an enfilade fire uh, where the the monitor and another ship, a Roanoke, was there. And um, not the Roanoke, it was a different ship. I forgot the name, the Gaiella or something like that. The Confederates started raining all of this fire down on them because they knew that they were trapped upriver because of this blockade. <laughs> but the monitor retreated. And then, like I said, at sea, it was lost. The Virginia, this is the Virginia's end. Now, as far as legacy is concerned, this is an American ship that was built in 1895 called the USS Maine. Yeah, that USS Maine, the one that actually got blown up down in Havana, you see, uh, that led to the Spanish-American War, which is something I'd be glad to do a lecture on. It's, I got a great lecture on it. And uh, see, so you can see that the ram is still incorporated into modern warships well into the late 19th and early 20th century in the same way that it did and Ben Hur, in the same way that it did with the CSS Virginia, modern, the most modern ships still incorporated the RAM, you see. Now, the, uh, the Merrimack and the Monitor is a famous story, obviously. If you're a Civil War buff, uh, then it's like, what happened to the Monitor? It must still be there. Let's find it. So these, these clever fellows over a place called the Mariner's Museum down in Virginia, is the best museum of its kind, I think. I always loved it. And they were going down onto these dive missions after locating the monitor and they were bringing up artifact after artifact, right? And here on display is the original anchor of one USS monitor. And then later on, there was this whole, you know, it takes a lot of money for this. They had something called the Monitor Project and they were able it, actually that is the entire turret you see, and what happens is the monitor flipped over, the turret fell off, landed in a, a different spot, and they were able to actually retrieve the turret, right? This was in, I don't know, like 2000, 2005, six, something like that. I really don't remember the exact date, but this is a big deal if you're into this kind of naval history stuff and artifacts. I think it's the coolest thing ever. And uh, there is the actual inside inverted turret of the monitor with the two Dahlgren cannons. Isn't that something? Now, this is all visible now. If you go down to the, this museum, you can see all of this stuff. You know, you've got to keep all of that stuff in salt water, by the way. You, you can't just like take it out and put a coat of paint on it. Okay. Um, the original dry dock that the Merrimack was turned into the CSS Virginia is still part of. Newport News Naval Shipyard. And there it is in this photograph. Now, 
the pinnacle of naval warfare as far as big guns and rotating turrets was like World War I. That carried over kind of like as, as a vestige into World War II. And here's a famous warship from World War I called the HMS Warspike, right, that fought in the Battle of Jutland. And the reason I'm using that example is because one of the things that caused World War I was this massive arms race of battleships between Great Britain and Kaiser Wilhelm, who wanted to have a big Navy to challenge the Royal Navy, uh, and which created this huge arms race in battleships and culminating in this large battle called the Battle of Jutland in the North Sea off Denmark. And what happened was that the battle was essentially strategically inconclusive. It wasn't tactically inconclusive, but neither side won and neither side lost because just like the Battle of Hampton Roads, the ships are so well armored that you couldn't sink the other ship, not with gunfire, you see? So it's a direct thread uh, from the Battle of Hampton Roads right up to modern warfare. And um, here's like pretty much the pinnacle of an example of rotating turrets right, and large guns, that was essentially Erickson, Erickson's idea. Here is a battleship memorial, the USS Massachusetts, if you've ever seen it at Fall River. And the Massachusetts is another massive example of a compact superstructure, very compact, and also you've got, this is the secondary ornament of, of five inch 38 caliber guns, and forward and aft, you have nine inch, huge, uh, nine huge 16 inch diameter naval rifles in rotating turrets, all, the, all straight from Ericsson's design. Okay, this is a ship that was used for Great Britain in World War II, World War I into World War II. And it, the reason I stuck this in here is because it's essentially just a low shallow draft vessel that has one massive gun on it. And the name of the warship, the type of warship is a monitor. It's called a monitor because just like the Battle of Hampton Roads, any ship by any nation's Navy that is just essentially this platform for one large rotating gun is called a monitor because of the Battle of Hampton Roads. And finally, this is under the, recon the recommissioning of the uh, famous battleship, American battleship, the USS Missouri, okay, in the 1980s. And once again, to show you to good effect, the ultimate expression of a large rotating turret, all changed, changed the history of naval warfare until, you know, the missile firing era in the Battle of Hampton Roads by cause of Ericsson's monitor. These are 16 inch naval rifles that are 50 caliber. The longer these things can put a 2,700 pound projectile with pretty fair accuracy on target at a range of 22 miles. Now down in Battery Park in New York City, right, right at the tip of Manhattan, this statue is there, right, to commemorate the New York launching of one USS Monitor in the hand of the brilliant engineer Ericsson. I wonder if you've ever seen that. It's right, at the, it's, it's in Battery Park, right in Manhattan. So that, that is our story for today. We're at 3.30. Uh, the story was of the monitor in the Merrimack, and I, get, I wanted to give you uh, the best flavor I could of what naval warfare and riverine warfare and how it overlapped into technology at this critical junction in time. Ladies and gentlemen, that's our program. I look forward to seeing you soon. And once again, I want to thank you for sharing some time with me. Um, any questions? Comments? anecdotes, family-friendly jokes. Okay. Well then, 
Uh, I will see you soon. Um, the recording will stop when I when I uh, stop the recording Thank and you. start. It was really interesting. Thank you very much, Arthur. You're welcome, everyone. Take Excellent. care of yourselves. Thank see you. See you soon. All right. Bye. Happy New Year. Bye bye. Bye.